It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It is the Jill on Money show, the first full weekend of August, and we hope that you are having a good summer so far. We have not let up with tackling your financial issues. If you've got a question, all you need to do is go to jillonmoney.com and click the contact us button. Then if you fill out the form, we'll answer your question via email when I do email segments, or if you'd like, let us know if you want to come on the air. Mark will do all the rest. That's what Jack did. He's on the line from New Jersey. Jack, welcome to the program. What can we do for you? So a little background information. Uh, I'm 59 years old, retired federal employee, uh, about 37 years or so. Uh, I currently work for a major government defense contractor, so I'm quasi-retired, shall we say. My wife is 57, and she's been self-employed for about 20 years now. Wow. Um, I have. So wait a second. You're a retired federal employee, so you have a pension right now? Correct, yes. And how much is that? That's $60,000 a year. And as the government contractor, how much are you earning? Uh, about 220 k Whoa. Oh, my God. And then your wife's self-employment, how much does she earn? Uh, per the book, sixty k a year. Okay. That's a lot of cash, man. That's that's good. And, and so what do you think you need to live on out of all of that moolah? Uh, based on the analysis that I've done over the years, I'm going to say uh, probably about thirteen uh, k a month. I use fifteen k in a lot of the calculators and so forth I do because there are – expenses that we're going to have to uh, incur when my wife uh, closes her business because, you know, okay. there are some shared expenses and things like that there. Okay, very good. And as a government contractor, what kind of retirement plan are you using through that income? Because obviously the pension is it's on its own. But what about the 220? Are you making any contributions to a retirement plan? Yes, I have, uh, you know, I have the standard 401k thrift savings plan through uh, my federal employment. And then I have uh, another 401k that I started with my current employer, which is currently a traditional. How much is in there right now in the tradition, the current traditional 401k? Okay, so uh, just so we're, I know which ones we're talking about here in my 401 TSP government, it's about about 1.5, 1.6 million dollars. So one and a half, 1.6 in the TSP. Your current retirement account is f- about 45k. Does your wife make contributions to some sort of retirement plan through that self-employment income? Yes, she has uh, a traditional IRA and a SEP, which is about 250 thousand dollars. Combined. Combined. Okay, got it. Money in the bank? I have about, um, I have, I have well, non-retirement funds. I have about 225 in a, in, uh, in a brokerage account. I got about another 125 in bank accounts, uh, 75 and a 529 for one of my daughters who's just going to start going to school uh, next year. Rutgers, I hope? You bet it. Very good. How much does Rutgers cost in state? Uh, I will say that it's probably going to cost me about $100,000 less for her to go to Rutgers than uh, some of the other out-of-state schools that she was looking at. But that's not exactly what I asked. Okay. How much does it cost? (laughs) About $25,000 a year. Okay. So you still have a little bit. And is that your only child attending school? Attending school, yes. Okay. And, And you said next year, right? Yes. So you can pay for, obviously, you can pay for some of this out of cash flow because you have the cash flow, right? And uh, okay, good. So that's pretty much, we'll spend that down and it's taken care of for her college, which is great. What other assets? How about a house? Um, I have uh, two properties. I have a primary residence that's worth about about $1.2, $1.3 million. And I owe about $125,000 at 2.5%. Um, I got about five years left. You have a, a a vacation home or a rental property? I have a rental property in New York City that's probably worth a little shy of, uh, well, it's about 900K. And uh, I get about $3,000 a month rent and my expenses are about $1,000 a month. 
Wow. Is there a mortgage on that rental? Uh, none. And you plan to keep it? Is that something that you want to do? Right now, that, I, I think that I, I kind of look at it as like a chip right now going forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like to keep it simply for the rental income. But, uh, you know, there's some different options as far as whether to possibly sell it and use it for some retirement funding to pay some other things. I have one of my daughters that has a you know, a little chunk of uh, student loan debt based on some additional schooling she planned and, planned, and a few things that we have uh, had the first time around. So that's one option. I got, you know, between the three girls, we have marriage and all these other things to worry about and so forth. So uh, a, a you know what? You don't have to worry about that. They have to worry about that. You know what I'm saying, man? Okay, wait. You got three girls. How old are they all? Uh, 28, 25, and 18. Wait, 28, 25, and 18, is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Who has the debt, 28 or 25-year-old? 28-year-old. How much debt is there? About 80K. All right. So 18-year-old going to college, so we have that. What do you think is like the game plan for you and your wife in terms of retirement and when you really think you're going to step back? My game plan has always been uh, to retire when my youngest gets out of college. Now, that may include some type of phased retirement or something like that, but that, that's that been kind of the strategy. I don't expect us to downsize too much if my daughters stay in the area because we're a very close family. So I think we we enjoy the, the house and the, the different facilities and things like that in the area. Mm-hmm. So you know, possibly purchasing something as a second place or renting down in Florida, you know, because I've become to like the snowbird concept more and more as I get older. Mm -hmm. So you're saying like at age 63, essentially, you'll be done, done or at 63, then scale back? Uh, I would say more likely like 64. The question I might have is probably trying to wait until I hit my full retirement age at 67 before I pull any social security out. Right. Uh, Because there's a large difference there. Yeah. Um, What's the 67? What's the full retirement benefit? uh, It's about 40K a year. So you got the 40, the 60 from the pension, and then you got this other, let's say, 25-ish from the rental property. So you got a lot of money that's coming in. Yeah. Plus my daughter will, excuse me, my daughter, my wife will probably be getting somewhere around 20, 25K in Social Security as well. Uh, so we're getting pretty close here on the money. So that sounds good. What else do I need to know about this situation? Do you guys have like old life insurance? You got estate documents? You got long-term care? What's going on and the other other stuff? Okay. Life insurance, we're, we're pretty well set. I have about $2 million in life insurance on me, 700K on my wife across different Federal employee retirements, current employer retirements, third party. Uh, my wife's got a little whole whole life thing, so I have a strategy with respect to that. Estate planning. I got all my uh, wills, living wills, powers of attorneys, things like that. The the biggest uh, thing is I also have a special needs trust and New Jersey able account for my middle daughter who is uh, disabled. We'll get back to Jack in just a second. If you've got a financial question, it's as easy as jillonmoney.com. Jill on Money, we'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And before we return to our listener, Jack, just want to remind you that a lot of you may need some overall financial planning guidance. And if that's your situation, you may want to check out our sponsor, Facet Wealth. Facet planners always have your interest at heart. That means they're all fiduciaries. So if you need to lift up the hood on your financial life, visit cbsaudio.com slash Jill. You'll get two months free off your first year of financial planning at Facet Wealth. Okay, let's get back to our listener, Jack. So how does that, how does her 
presence in your life in terms of retirement? How does that influence your decisions around retirement? Uh, well, that's the, the main concern or question I have. I, I can't necessarily just go off of, uh, you know, just basic numbers as much as making sure I, I have all my bases covered for her because the strategy right now, while we don't have guardianship for her, I, I foresee her to be financially and socially dependent on us for the rest of our lives. So so I've done things like, for example, I've gone ahead and declared her through my federal employment to be eligible for health ins- my health insurance coverage after age 26. Okay. Um, so between that and Medicaid, she's well covered there. I, n- I need to learn more about as she progresses older and so forth. But the question is, I think she's going to be living with us. So I'm, prob- I'm going to need to account for not only my you know, getting through my life, but then what do I need to her do life. to lessen the burden on my other children and, right. and make things comfortable for her? Right. And what about the other girls? Like, should we be really thinking like, look, she's the number one priority and we've got to make sure she's got enough money and that whatever is left after that would be available for the other two? Do they know that? And if, And is that your intention? I, I think the two of them, uh, based on how well they've done uh, through through their lives so far, I, I, I'm comfortable with respect to their, uh, their independence uh, and growth. So I, I don't want to say who's, if anything, is more important and everything, but not only is taking care of my middle daughter important to her, but obviously is important to to them as well. Mm-hmm. So for mm-hmm. for different reasons, for various reasons. So that, um, that's like I would put it that way. Okay, and they're close, and so that's good. So what you are sort of considering is let's just make sure we back up. You got all this money, which is great. You've got the house. Great. You need to keep the house to make sure she can live with you. Do you think she will need some care that you would need to pay for? Like, for example, today you're 60, you're fine. But in 15 years, does she need more care that you would that you would not be able to provide? That that's kind of one of the challenges. She's very high functioning. She's got a part time job, but you know I think there's always going to need to be some assistance there, based on how well she's been doing. Uh, I I'm anticipating that to be less and less, but you know there's there's the unknown there. Okay. So I, I think the answer to that is yes, but at a smaller amount, more from more from making sure that she has the housing and and whatever you know additional right. daily supports and so forth, but. Okay. So big picture, you have the 60, you guys will have social security of let's call it another 60 between the two of you. So you have 120 coming in. Okay. And then I'm not even including the rental for a second, because I do think you may want to have that rent. You may want to sell that rental. You have then a million and a half, one, seven, five, to, so you've got just over $2 million in assets, invested assets, right? And then you have the 900000 in the rental. I mean, look, the rental income's okay, but nine hundred grand is a crap load of money. And to say to yourself, like, after expenses, I'm making twenty five grand on 900000 is not like a fantastic yield. It's not like you're, do you know what I mean? Like, so it may be just especially in this scenario where you might want to free up cash, that this could be something that's a good thing to sell. And I'm just saying, maybe if you are looking down the road at 64 to 67, you know what this argues. This means that you, those three years, you're going to need some extra money to spend. And look, if you have some free cash flow now and you want to help out your oldest daughter with some of that debt, that seems fine to me. I don't see like that doesn't seem like a bad thing at all. If you want, you know, I mean, you've got more money than you need right this second. So how quickly do you think that you'd like to start helping your 28 year old? I would like to do that this year. The only the one of the questions is we're kind of anticipating that uh, we'll be hearing wedding bells in the next uh next couple of years or whatever it is. So there's uh, some questions there as far as uh, 
where to help or what are, where we can help. I'll put it that way. Uh, well, so, look, you know you can help, but you've got to. You're going to have to pull back on putting money away in retirement. It's just going to leave you less money. So again, knowing you have that nine hundred thousand dollar asset that you could pull the trigger on at any time makes me feel more comfortable saying like, sure, go spend some money or don't save as much money in your current retirement account that has $45,000 and just like pull back and say, all right, I won't, I'm not going to put as much money in there. Just think of it this way. Between now and age 64 in these five years, you've got two big bills. One is potential wedding and two is paying down that debt, right? And whatever extra money 18 year old needs for college. So you just need to come up with that money. So maybe it's just that the current, that, that maybe your pension right now that you're receiving, you say, all right, for the next five years, I'm going to take that money and I'm going to pay down the debt and sock that money away for a wedding. The only thing I don't have that I think is the biggest question is long-term care insurance. Do you really need it? Let's think about that because you'll have a pension. Is your pension a survivor? Or is it just based on your life? No, I, I have a survivor. She gets 50%. You know, when, when well, I presuming, okay. So if you can liquefy that asset of the apartment, then you don't need it. If you keep that asset, then you might need it. So if you're always willing to sell the rental, then you're you're fine. Then you don't need long-term care insurance because then you have plenty of money. You're sort of in that like I've got more than two and a half million dollars and I don't and I'm self-insuring. If you want to look into it, you can get some some base coverage. It's just a god awful amount of money. It really is. But I don't think you need it. Mark, do you think they need long term care? Uh, my insurance policy is that apartment. I know. That's what I keep thinking. So I like that apartment. I, I don't really think you need it. As long as you're willing to sell that apartment, that's your, that is the ace in the hole, if you will. Okay. All right. All right. That, that, I, I, and no house and no yeah. house. You're not buying a house in Florida, by the way. You can rent. That's fine. But no buying a house. No, no, no. You will not be owning three residences. Okay. Oh, okay. Unless you say I'm selling Jersey, we're all moving down. You, your wife and your daughter are moving to Florida then it works. But you're not doing that. You just said you're not going to do that. Go rent. Go rent a place for a month. No, it's yeah. entertaining, entertaining a, uh, just a condo unit or something like that. But What do you uh, mean just a condo unit? Do you know how much that is? I need you to have liquidity. You cannot afford, in your situation, you cannot afford to take a chunk of your money and pop it into some dopey condo in Boca West where you're like, oh, it's nice to be a snowbird. And I don't have that 600 grand that I need for you. You hearing that? That's no, the dream I'm, I'm crusher. With- Again, you tell me you're going to sell the apartment and you're saying, oh, I'm going to buy a really cheap little place in Florida for 300 grand, which you can't find anymore right now anyway. And I'm going to take the other 600 grand. I'm going to put it in with my non-qualified money, my account. And now I'm going to have 825 grand in there and I'm all good. You don't have enough liquidity to take a big hundreds of thousands of dollars out of this current situation and buy another place. You just don't. If you want to replace one of those illiquid assets with a different illiquid asset, I'm okay with it. But be very careful. Liquidity is your friend. You're young. You are not planning for 35 years of your future. You're planning for 35 years of your future plus another 50 years for your daughter's future, right? So we got to be careful. All right. If you've got financial questions, how about this? Just go to our website, jillonmoney.com and bookmark it. It's Jill on Money. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Let's dive right in. It's Michelle in Delaware. Michelle, what's going on for you? What can we do? Well, hi, Jill. Hi, Mark. Um, I'm anxious. I, I'm a school nurse and I am wanting to retire. I'm not at that age yet. Well, I'll be 59 this year. And the earliest I can retire and get my um, benefits 
um, as far as my pension is mm-hmm. 62. So three yeah. years to go is really what we're talking about, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Tell us more about yourself. Are you uh, married, single, partnered? I'm divorced. You're on the front line. And so are you just, are you exhausted? Like, how are you feeling? What's happening? I'm, I'm mentally exhausted. Mm-hmm. Um, just I work in an elementary school and um, just before COVID, it was an exhausting job. It's a rewarding job, but it's just, it's a lot. Um, and COVID just took it to a whole, whole nother level. All right. Let's, let's take a deep breath and see what we can figure out for you to get you out of this situation. So uh, how much do you earn right now, Michelle? Um, right now I'm earning anywhere. It ranges um, based on work in summer school, but mm-hmm. um, th- this year I, it was 99,000. Okay, great. Do you make a retirement contribution out of that 99,000? I do. What do you put away? Well, um, in the 457B, I'm uh, doing $800 a month. Okay, great. And are you saving any other money in addition to that? Well, I was putting money into a um, brokerage account with TD um, Ameritrade. And when the economy started going haywire, um, I stopped putting money in. So I just have a little bit of savings on the side right now. How much money is in the TD Ameritrade account right now? Um, the value of the account is yes. is ten thousand. Okay, and do you have like a nice, like boring savings account also that's floating around out there? It's extremely boring. <laughs> boring is beautiful when the things are moving around, don't you think? Yeah. There, there's barely anything in in the account right now. It's I would say it's probably two thousand. Okay. And how much money is in the four the four fifty seven the eight hundred a month? How much is in that account right now? Right now is fifty six k. All right. Do you um, rent or own? I own. What do you figure the house is worth? Right now it's worth three three eighty. How about a mortgage? Do you have one? I do. I refinanced um, with the divorce to get the mortgage in my name. Um, mm-hmm. So I did a twenty year mm-hmm. just. Because I, I didn't want to pay very long. Mm-hmm. Um, and I refinanced for 223 at that time. Okay. What's the interest rate on that 20 year mortgage? It's 2.87. Don't make any extra payments on that. You promise? Pinky I, swear I, with me I right now. I promise. Okay. Um, you have kids? I do. They're adults, um, two sons. Uh, Doing okay? Like, do you need to help them at all? Or are they okay? Well, they're they're okay right now. I, I think they're <laughs> <laughs> today. But yes, tomorrow. Who knows? Yeah, my savings went to them uh, last year and the year before. Oh, all right. But they're but you but you think okay for now? Like no yes. more money going. Okay. No. Um, is there any other money or assets that's outstanding that I should know about? I, I do have assets. Um, from a previous job, I had a four hundred one k, and I um, I had rolled that over into the school um, four fifty six. But then um, in twenty twenty, um, a very very good friend and my oldest son convinced me to um, roll that over into an IRA with TD. How much is in there now? Right now, it's one thirty four. Okay. Yeah, Listen, that's good. That's mm-hmm. fine. That's great. Any old insurance policies or anything like that kicking around? No, nothing with a um with a a, a ben, you know savings benefit to mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. I do. I just have a term policy right now, and the only reason I keep it is because it's so low. Uh, you know, it, it just costs a little bit per year. It's three thirty a year, and it's two hundred and fifty thousand. So how much do you estimate that you need to live on? To live on in retirement, I estimated at least 3000 3500 a month. Okay. And right now, if you were to look ahead, and let's just pretend you're 62, poof, mm-hmm. you're 62, what would your pension benefit be? Do you know? At 62, it would be almost six, 1600 Sixteen hundred a month. Okay, good. You would also be entitled to Social Security at some point. Do you know what that Social Security benefit would look like? 
I do. Um, at 62, it would be 1978. Mm -hmm. um, at 65, it would be 2467. And at 67, it would be 2861. Okay. So if you, I know you're fried. So I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to acknowledge that. And I don't want to make this more painful for you and say like, well, just gut it out and keep working. Right. But uh, So if you were to step down right now, could you get another job for a few, you know, three, four five years doing something that's not quite as stressful? Would you be willing to do that? When I think about it, um, as a nurse in Delaware, I, the only other jobs I could take would be going back to home care which I don't want to do. Okay. How about if I have like you working in a Starbucks or something? Like, I mean, a job, not like, oh my God, you've got to use your all of your training. Like, would you be willing to just do something to have some money come in the door? That's what I'm asking you. If I was to retire like right now? Yeah, this second. N no. I was <laughs> <laughs> So you want to know. So so really you're 59 this year and I got three years to get you through to your, to you get your pension. Can you last three years? I mentally, I, I, I already know I can last three years. I, okay. I switched from elementary to high school. I'll be working with two other nurses. So I won't have that burden of just me handling a 500. Oh my God. That's yeah. unbelievable what you had to do. Yeah. yeah. So you can do three more years and you yeah. want to know that if in three years you call it quits, you'll be OK. Is that the real question here? I, that is the real question. We'll get back to Michelle in just a minute. You are listening to Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. We'll be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And we are here trying to help you make really good financial decisions. It doesn't have to be the best financial decision. It has to be the best financial decision for you, for your family. Maybe it's the next best step you can make after running into a tough time. But one thing is certain, as you listen to this program, I don't want you to feel like your situation is not worthy of a call or an email. Every one of us has financial issues. People who have a lot of money have financial issues. People who don't have a lot of money have financial issues. And I think so much of this is due to the fact that money can be quite emotional. And that's why Mark and I love doing the program, because it allows us to help you take the emotion out of it. So right now, let's get back to our listener, Michelle, and talk more about her retirement. Your benefit really does jump pretty enormously between 62 and 67. It the, does. You know, if I could wave my magic wand, I would be like, oh, maybe you can last five years. I don't know. But I, but let's just do the three years. In three years, you get $1,600 a month. And that's, you know, we know that you need more than that. Uh, and so where are we getting that extra two grand? Right. And so if you, you know, you don't have that much money saved, you know, between the 457 and the IRA rollover, uh, you know, you're going to have a couple hundred thousand dollars. And you could see that, you know, that could go pretty quickly. And so I don't want to deplete all of that money while you're so young. The reason that I would want you to work is not because I'm, I'm mean. I'm worried that you would kind of blow through a lot of that $200,000 because you couldn't have it grow. Even if like the market were going great guns, you really couldn't afford to have it all be at risk because we know that you need to live on it, right? So if you think about between age 62 and 67, we need out of that $200,000, we have to come up with 
another two grand a month. So we need to spend 25 grand a year for five years. That means that by the time you're 67 and collecting social security, you don't have that much money left over. And I don't want to leave you with so little in the bank. I, I don't think that that's enough money to just say done at 62. So here's what I think. If you are un, if you really just say like, look, I, I know what I do. I know how to do it. I've already made a shift to make my life a little better by going to high school. I think you're going to need to work beyond age 62. I think that you're going to have to go to closer to 65 because you are going to live for a long time. Yes. You know, if you retire and you're 65, think about this. You have 30, possibly 30 years of not working. Yes, you have Social Security and yes, you'll have a pension, but we need another pot of money that you can dip into and for other stuff. Can I play devil's advocate? Why not? So 62, she's, you know, she's fried. She's done. I know it's not ideal, but she takes Social Security. She gets her pension that covers her monthly nut and she doesn't have to touch her nest egg. But what if she has like needs a new car? You know what I mean? Like there are things that are going to come up. I that- would need a new car. What's the health care situation at 62? Yeah, do you have full health care because you're a nurse? I mean, through for the school, through the school? Not at 62, I won't. So my right. situation. When does that kick in? It, it kicks in at, actually it kicks in at 66. Mark, yeah. now, now you're liking my 65 plan, aren't you? Yeah, I, I, I already knew you were going, going to go. Oh, I'm sorry. But I think at 65 it works. I do. Forget about the stupid TD account with 10 grand in it. I want a boring savings account and I want you to put in $10,000 a year while you're working into that savings account so that by the time you hit, you know, I want literally by the time you're 65, I want there to be fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in there. That's what I want. I want you to have some safe, boring money. Yes, I agree. You know, you can have an ETF, you can have a managed account, you can do all those things, but like you need to have some money in cash, some money in stocks, some money in bonds and and just be like, okay, I want to sleep at night. And if you work till you're 65, I think this is going to work out beautifully. If you decide that you really hate it and you need to move on, then you need to come up with some other game plan to make money for those interim years before you can claim Social Security at 67. I really don't think it's a great idea. And I would very much advise against claiming Social Security at 62, even before 67. Just the penalty is so big. It is. It's it's just not worth it. So you've killed yourself. You've done a great job. I'm glad, you know, and maybe, listen, maybe now that you're in high school, you can last longer. Yeah. That's my hope for you. Yeah, I feel I can. What about, a, do you have a will? Do you have a power of attorney? Do you have a health care proxy? I'm actually meeting with a, um, a representative from a funeral home to talk about. Oh, like, wait a minute. Wait a minute about the funeral <laughs> home. Hold on a second. Those guys are shysters. Hold on one second. No. So um, I don't want you to, don't buy some fancy pre-planned funeral do-do-do. Don't do that. Do not do that. What I'm saying to you is you need to have an attorney draft a will for you. And one of your sons or both of your sons need to be assigned the health care decision maker on your behalf. Do not pay anything right now for a funeral or anything like that. Please don't do that. Okay, we'll wrap up with Michelle in just a minute. It's Jill on Money. Check out our website, jillonmoney.com. We've got wonderful content there and you can always hit the contact us button. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Let's wrap up our conversation with Michelle. Do you have any friends who are lawyers? Uh, no, but I do have a lawyer that I could um, go to. Yeah. 
go talk to this lawyer, probably like someone who did real estate. I want a simple will. I'm leaving everything to my kids, splitting it evenly. But most importantly, because most of your assets are retirement assets. So your kids are just going to get it because of contract. In other words, when you die, an IRA says, here are your beneficiaries. It's probably split between your two kids and they're old now so they can get it. Right. I want you to be thoughtful about who's going to make the decision and how I want that decision made for my health care. And someone has to make financial decisions for me if for some reason I can't make it on my own behalf. Don't pre-plan a funeral and do not spend the money on that. Spend the money on the lawyer now. Okay. 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 Um, I just had a couple questions. Go on. Right now I have a disability policy I've been paying for since God knows, maybe since I was in my twenties or thirties. Mm-hmm. And I keep thinking I should, it's like 58 a month. I could, just close that out and start putting that in the savings. You had disability. Probably someone sold that to you before you entered a school system. Is that my guess? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you don't need that. That's fine. Because it, it, it only pays out to, like, if you were to be disabled between now and the time that you retired, then it would pay out. But I presume you have disability through the school system, right? Yes. Yeah, don't, you don't need it then. All right. That sounds that sounds like a plan. You, you um, confirmed many of the things I was already thinking and just lowered my anxiety because now I can, I can face reality. I already told All right. You know what? That's so funny that you should say that. It's like you're in healthcare, but do you ever notice that like when you tell a parent or you tell somebody like what the actual situation is, it's almost better. It's the uncertainty that'll make you nuts. Yes, absolutely. Okay. That's it. That's our number one. Stay tuned. Jill on money will continue. the weekend and that can only mean one thing you're listening to jill on money the show that takes the mystery out of your finances here's your host jill schlesinger you're back it's our number two of jill on money And let's get going with answering your financial questions. We are starting this hour with Greg from Buffalo. What can we do for you today, Greg? Well, I just had a question. Uh, I have some extra money. I was wondering where I could invest it or what the best place to put it would be. Okay. Tell us about yourself. How old are you? I'm in my early 50s. I'm retired from the Navy after 22 years. So I have my pension there. And both of my parents, unfortunately, recently passed. And I oh. Wanna... So I have a pretty good chunk of money I'd like to invest somewhere. Uh, I do have a second career, mm-hmm. and my 401k is maxed out at my job. So I'd just like to put that money to work somewhere. Okay. You're retired from the Navy. What's your pension amount? Uh, about 2400 And then how much are you earning now in addition to that? Um, just under seventy. Great. And you're maxing out your 401k. That's amazing. Fantastic. How much extra money are we talking about? Probably about 40000 Do you own a home? Yes. How much is it worth? Probably about one eighty. And do you have a mortgage outstanding still? No, it's paid off. So you got the house. It's paid off. How much is in the 401k right now? Just under one fifty. And are you married or single? Um, divorced, yeah. Okay. Kids? Uh, grown. Okay. No other debt that's outstanding, right? None. Cars paid off, everything. Awesome. Fantastic. Any money in just um, besides the extra money, the 40, um, just an emergency reserve, like a bank account or something? Yeah, I have an extra 10, 15. Where do you have your 401k? Through work with Vanguard. 
How about if we opened up an account with Vanguard? You can just do it very easily, just a personal brokerage account. And we have you invest that money. Now, I guess one one other question I should ask. Do you feel comfortable investing the money on your own behalf? No, I like to let somebody who knows what they're doing handle it, part of it. I think maybe the Vanguard Digital Advisor might be worth your your time here. You open up an account, you answer a bunch of questions about yourself, like when do you need the money and how's your risk tolerance? And you know, you have been investing and you certainly have a 401k. You answer these questions and then the money will basically be invested consistent with the way that you have answered those questions. And that is a very cheap and efficient way for you to get this 40 grand to work. I mean, look, I I could also argue that like, it's not imperative that you actually put this money to work. It may be worth your while to keep a little bit extra money in cash. I mean, making 70 grand plus your pension, are you just banking the pension right now? Pretty much, yeah. I use it to pay off my house early. Yeah, so I, I presume that like your house is paid off and you're making the money and so your your emergency reserve will build up over time. Uh, well, how long, much longer do you think you want to work? Um, <laughs> not long. <laughs> as short as I can possibly do it. I'd like to work part-time is what I'd like to do and something I enjoy a little bit more than my current line of work. Let me ask you something. How much do you think you need to live on? I could live on my pension. You could, but if you like having the extra money. But I'd be, I'd be, I wouldn't be able to go on vacation or if my, if I wrecked my truck, then I wouldn't be able to just buy another one, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So what about this? You're in your early fifties. What if, you know, you work, you work, you get this, do whatever you have your job. It's fine. Also in the meantime, you keep building up your emergency reserve fund. You've got the pension. You'll be able to claim social security, right? I mean, what you're really talking about, you said you're in your early fifties, you probably could go to a part-time gig. You know, you probably could in the next few years. I would like you to have the emergency reserve fund beefed up before you do that. So I'd like you to have like 40 or 50 grand in emergency reserves. You'll have the extra money you've invested in the Vanguard Digital Advisor. You'll have your 401k. And then I'd like to see how you do just working as much as you need to like have your fun vacation fund. Like you don't have to have a full time gig. You really don't. Like if you think about you're in your early 50s, if you think like, well, I'll just do this for a few more years, I'll build everything up. Then you work part time just to float your your expenses. And then, you know, maybe you do that for five years or another 10 years. And then because I mean, you you, you are young, you probably want to do something with yourself. And then when you claim Social Security, Social Security plus your pension, you're kind of living pretty well. And you'll have all this money that you've saved. So it seems to me like that's kind of the general game plan. Would that work for you? That's kind of where I was heading. I just got like that that gap period between, you know, now and then being able to claim Social Security or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, but if, as long as you're willing to do something, I don't, I'm not saying you have to work full time. You just want to be able to cover your expenses. And it would be nice for you, I think, working full time for now. What's nice is you build up the 401k, but you also build up your retirement, your um, emergency reserve fund. And that will give you, I think, a little bit more flexibility. And the money that you have that goes into this Vanguard account is part of your game plan, which is money you can access before Social Security. Is that like a Roth or a traditional IRA? Nope. nope. It's just a plain old brokerage account, like based on your income. It's not tax deferred. You know, I I would rather you actually not necessarily put money into a Roth because I think you're going to need the money and I want you to have access to it before 59 and a half. Just in case you may be like, "Ugh, I'm done with this. You know, I want to give you flexibility is with someone who's got a pension like you. I think that the thing that's kind of neat is that you have this like base of money and you know that if you had to, you could survive on that. But you don't want to do that. You want to have a little bit of fluff in your in your cash flow. The way you create the fluff is by working part-time. Now you're working full-time right now, which is great. And so I would use this period of time of the next few, you know, whatever, three, five, seven years, however long you really want to do it to give you some more flexibility as you approach your 60s. I think at least that a lot of people who are working part-time 
tend to have a lot of longevity because it's like, I'm keeping busy, but I don't feel awful. I don't feel like, oh, I have to be here every single day working, you know, like working for the boss that you have some flexibility, build the flexibility that you want. And that's what you're doing right now. Yeah. I was kind of hoping to get a gig that I enjoy, enjoy going to work. Well, maybe you will, right? I mean, it is still a hot labor market. Maybe you will, or maybe you're like, ah, I'll grid it out and then I'll just do a little part-time thing. And and maybe when you're part-time, you will like it a lot more, but let's see, you know, you, you may, you may find that you are, that you can do something different and that will be, I think a really, I just think it's going to be a great relief for you just to know you've got a few bucks in the bank. You got a few bucks in the Vanguard account. You've got the pension. You got the 401k. All good. I don't think that there's any reason why I would encourage you to like start doing a Roth or start doing um, more money in your retirement account. Your non-retirement assets are going to give you the flexibility you need. Do you have a financial issue that requires a little bit of assistance? Maybe you need some coaching. Maybe it's a question about a job. Maybe it's a question about some new benefits. We're here for you. Go to JillOnMoney.com, click the Contact Us button, and we'll help you out. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and this is the program that attempts to take the mystery out of your financial life. And of course, you can give us a holler anytime you do have a question by going to our website, jillonmoney.com and clicking the contact us button. But if you're thinking about getting more in-depth advice, if you really need a certified financial planner, then you may want to check out our sponsor, Facet Wealth. Facet Wealth is able to provide financial planning services to all different kinds of people, maybe people just like you. And they do it by putting your interests first. All of their financial planners are fiduciaries, so they've got to put you first. If you're looking for holistic financial planning, visit cbsaudio.com slash Jill for two months free off your first year of financial planning with Facet Wealth. Okay, now back to you. We are talking to Lisa from Austin, Texas. So Lisa, what brings you to us today? So I want to know if we are doing everything right or everything wrong. And we are, um, back to that in, in a minute, but we are thinking about taking a sabbatical, taking <laughs> some time off, maybe six months or a year, a little longer. And we are self-employed. So making this decision is is a biggie. Um, yeah, you kind. I kind of wish you're like, yeah, I work for Dell, and they're giving us a six month sabbatical paid. That's not happening. You would have to pay yourself, basically. We would probably, yeah, we would have to make a big life decision. Okay, let's. Let, who's the we in this? There's a spouse. So my husband. Mm-hmm, we work together. And oh boy, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Work together. That's mm-hmm. a lot. That's mm-hmm. serious. Uh, how old are you guys? I am uh, 48. We'll be 48. I like that you had a moment there. Hmm, yes. Let me think about how old I am. Well, well, I was 38 for about three years in a row. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the husband? Is he also in his late 40s? No, he's 52. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the small business that you own, do you Mm -hmm. guys draw salaries? Yes, we draw a salary, uh um, each of us, and Mm -hmm. we have one employee. One employee. And is that person also related to you? (laughs) No, he's not related to us. Um, He is his own man. Okay. How much do you earn salary-wise together? So we each draw, I think, 65 a year, mm-hmm. um, but then we do other draws throughout the year. So that's Do you just, do like S-Corp distributions or LLC distributions? We are an S-Corp, and so we do distributions throughout the year. Mm-hmm. How much does that 
uh, how much do those S corp distributions total? I don't know, but I can say like our AGI, mm. um, I have that number if you're interested. Sure. Is 254. Do you guys have a retirement plan for these, uh, for this 250 grand salary slash S corp distribution? Yes, we do. We do. We went, we switched from a SEP to mm-hmm. a 401 a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, all the years prior, we contributed to a SEP, and then we decided that um, a 401 would be better for us. So we did that, and so we maxed that out. And then uh, the years we have more funds, we match. Okay, um, great. Yeah. That's great. And you do this, and your employee also participates in the 401k, right? Not Yet, but he will. Not if you take a sabbatical. Well, if we take a sabbatical, I think we would have to sell. Mm -hmm. The whole thing? Mm -hmm. (gasps) Wow. That's a huge decision. Now I've just gone from sabbatical to selling a business. Yeah, I don't think it's so hands-on that I Mm. don't think anybody else can do it. Okay, fair enough. All right, now let's do some more numbers then. The SEP money did you roll it into your 401k or is it sep is it is it just separate. sitting there it's separate okay how much is in the sep i don't know what's in the sep but i can tell you combined mm-hmm. you mean the sep and the 401k the sep and the 401 is 1.1 1. 1. great fantastic mm-hmm. what about in non retirement accounts do you guys have a cash account like a little slush fund kind of account we do we have another about 1.1 1. 1 in other savings that are so that would be cash brokerage account other stuff or is that really cash is that really like savings and money market is 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 any of the 1.1 at risk probably all of it it's all it's all in a um index fund that's part of the question is that we all have we have it all in stocks or an index fund okay that's fine. All right. We'll, we'll deal with that. That's an easy problem to fix. I promise. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, next question for you. Do you own a home? We do have a home. Mm-hmm. How much is it worth? I think probably 1.1. 1. 1. Everything is 1.1 1. 1 in their lives, Mark. You can yes. mention this. It's a, good, it's a good theme. Is it's there a, a mortgage theme. outstanding? No, we paid it off. Um, it was one of the things we decided to do when we were younger. We mm-hmm. felt very aggressive about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we, we did that. Mm-hmm. Okay. And if you were to take a sabbatical, would you go someplace or would you stay yeah. put? Well, we would like to go somewhere. Yeah. Uh-huh. Do some exploring. We feel like we haven't really, we want to travel. We haven't seen family and friends from around the country. You're just, just wasted from the, being a small business owner, basically. We, yeah. We, every day, even during COVID, we went to work every day. We didn't work from home. We didn't have the opportunity to work at home. So uh-huh kept schedule. And so I think it's time for us to kind of, you know, see the world. And we both are actually thinking of maybe a career change, but we don't know exactly what that would be. So that that complicates it. All right. Well, wait a second. Mm -hmm. We're going to see what you need to think about. If you could sell the business, if you had to fire sale the business Mm -hmm. right now, what could Mm -hmm. we get for it? So it's probably valued at about 300, but in reality, if someone was really to buy it, I think mm-hmm. probably 150. Okay. So if getting 300 would be difficult, we'd have to wait around and really. Yeah. If you said out. like, I want out, give me some moolah, give me some travel mm-hmm. funds. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. How about um, children? I forgot to ask about that. Are there some of those? Yes. We are they two- ready to come aboard or are you going to just leave them in Austin to ha- tend to themselves? No, we need <laughs> someone to watch the dog. So. <laughs> How old are your kids? So we have uh, uh, two boys. That one is 20. One is 17. So the 20-year-old is a rising junior, and the 17-year-old is a rising senior. So one is uh, in his third year of college, mm-hmm. and um, the other one we're looking for colleges. And I have another question about colleges, just planting that seed. Is rising junior in college in state school right now? He's in a state school. Mm-hmm. How much does that cost? So I would say probably about 30 a year. Do you guys have money set aside for that? We do. Yes, we have. We participated in the Texas Tomorrow Fund. Mm -hmm. And so we prepaid the tuition for the tuition portion of it about 10 years ago. And so we got locked into that. You bought a bunch, you bought units and that, that takes care of that. And then we have a little bit in a 529 that takes care of his, um, 
living expenses. As so well. you're good. So even though it's 30 grand a year, you mean it's it's taken care of essentially. It's taken care of. And so we have our other son now rising. Mm-hmm. And so we have the same situation with him, but he wants to leave Texas. He wants to go somewhere else. And so his tuition may be a little high, actually will be higher for sure. Can you say not- no to him or not? Right. That- so that's my question is, is I don't know the value in that anymore. I'm really confused. I don't know if it's worth it. First of all, okay, so our high school senior, he says, I don't want to go to UT. Mm-hmm. I want, I'm just going to make it up. I want to go to uh, Florida. So can I use the Texas Tomorrow Fund? I can't, can I? Or, or is there some penalty to get the money out of there? No, there is no there. There is a penalty to get out. But if you use it for tuition, mm-hmm. you can, we bought, for example, 400 units. You can use the value of the unit. To I got you. Other school. I got it. Um, I got it. OK. But, um, and then you just pay the difference. So it okay. is it takes a little money off the top, which is nice. Yeah, but it's but you're right. I mean, it's not like you're going to have to pay everything. And then you also have another 529 plan for his expenses as well, his future expenses. Okay. We'll get back to Lisa in just a minute. If you've got financial questions, if you've got concerns, if you want to run a scenario by us, just go to our website, jillonmoney.com. And while you're there, sign up for the free newsletter. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are here trying to help you make better financial decisions. And we do that with uh, just a little bit of work on your part. Here's what we ask. We ask that you go to our website, which shouldn't be so hard now that you've bookmarked it after all of these weekends of hearing me talk about bookmarking our website. Go to jillonmoney.com and you bookmark that website. And then whenever a financial issue crops up, you call up the website and you click the contact us button. And when that form appears, you write out your question. Now, if you're shy, you can leave it at that. But if you would like to join us on the air live, all you need to do is check the box. And by doing so, Mark will then wrangle you and arrange to get you on the air. It's as easy as that. So right now, let's get back to our conversation with Lisa from Austin, Texas. Is this rising senior in high school a killer? Is he like, I want to go to MIT and that's what I, or is it like, I'm sick of being in Texas. I want to go to Mississippi. Like, I I need to understand who this kid is. That's a really good question. And we're trying to figure that out. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, you have a better idea. 17 years later, we got to know who this kid is. So um, I think a little bit of both. Um, I think he's a good student. And I think he would thrive out of the state. Um, I think he's one of those COVID kids, right, who, you know, got stuck here for a year Uh, with the computer. He's kind of come out of that. He's doing really well. But I think he would thrive kind of out of the nest in a different environment. And and also, even if it were a a little bit more expensive, you do have money. So that's good. But is there a value there? I guess that's my question. I think, you know, there's a lot of back and forth about Uh, that, right? Mark and I are going to give you I think, a little bit of like a reality check. Now, Mark, would you like to go first and talk about the value of a just a different experience and what what that could mean in the future? Based on her description of her son, I think it's not so much an educational value. If there's a value, I think it'll be more of maybe a social value for him. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Like, it might be more fun for him and it might be really more engaging for him. That doesn't necessarily equate to like, oh, you're going to get a better job because I doubt it would because you've got a very strong college system in Texas. I mean, especially, I don't know if he'd want to. Does the older one go to um, Austin or not? He does not. He's at the UT, uh, another UT school. Okay. Mm -hmm. Only because like, you know, obviously the Austin, like it's like the crown jewel. On the other hand, I have a friend who grew up in Berkeley who said she'd rather die than go to UC Berkeley. 
right? Because even though it's an amazing school, she's like, it's like going to school, like where your mother goes shopping, like ain't happening, you know, like not, not going to happen. So as long as it's not too much money out of your pockets, then I think fine. You know what I mean? Like, I really do think like, that's okay. Just don't fool yourself into saying like, we're doing this because it's going to be better for his career. Cause it probably won't be. It'll probably be better for him or more interesting for him. It will not amount to like, I'm going to make $25,000 a year more when I get out. I doubt that highly. I really do. When would we start our, um, when would we start our sabbatical after high school graduation? I think so. Sorry, Seems honey. Like- we can't make it to graduation because mommy and daddy are going to be in uh, Spain. Bye. Are we going abroad for this six months or what? No, I don't know. And I think that's part of what we're kind of really interested in doing is just not having this really solid itinerary, just really exploring ourselves and like trying to take back our youth and, you know, wow. figure out what phase two is. And, you know, a lot of other people do. Why can't we? Why can't you? Let's think about this. You're 48 years old. You'll be 49. You'll be 49 and 53 when this all happens, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're talking about six months, right? Maybe a year. Tell me the. Tell me what you really want. Let's try to do the idealized version. I don't know. Uh, let's say a year because let's, let's say, say a year without income because even if you did six months of like let's wander, we need six months to re-enter. Yes, and I also think that let's say we rent our house. Yeah, what can we get in rent? So somebody who a family or a couple who wants to rent our house would probably want it for a one year lease term. Right. And how much would you think that you could? The Austin market is kind of on the hot side right now. Sure. So any year, it's hard to know anywhere between five and 6,500. Okay. Let's just say five to six grand a month. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. In your current situation where you're making a hundred, forget about the S Corp distribution, distributions for a second. Could you guys live on your 130 grand a year in salary right now or not? Oh, Yes. But- so we need $100,000 for the year set mm-hmm. aside, right? Mm-hmm. That's the baseline of what we need for you guys. We need $100,000 in cash right now, right? Mm-hmm. And then I'm not even going to include your house for a second. And then you'll have the house also. What about health insurance while you're meandering around your life? So we purchase our own health insurance. We pay, you know, per month. It's okay. not the greatest, but it just covers us as okay. a family. So now we got, just to go through this, we've got, million that's in index funds. We've got $1.1 million in retirement accounts. We've got a $1.1 million house with no mortgage. We want you guys in 11 months to be out of this business where you may or may not be able to sell it immediately, but let's just say you've sold it. Let's say you've sold it on June 1st of 2023 and you don't get your 150,000, you get 100,000. That's all you're going to get. Okay. So I'm just going to say a hundred grand from the business cash from biz. But I think that in preparation for this, what I would suggest, we'll know more next year, obviously, is, you know, that $1.1 million that's in your brokerage, your index funds, we do want to free up some of that cash. The money that you have right now in your index funds, if there's any money that's being reinvested, don't reinvest it. I want you to have some money. Remember, we're trying to stockpile. I want you to have 150 grand of cash before we start this endeavor, just in cash, okay? Boring, savings, checking, money market, completely boring. Then on top of that, if you happen to get cash out of the business, great, but that there's going to be no... You, it's not, this is, this whole game plan is not predicated on you selling your business. We're going to do this as if the business goes to zero. Then you're going to rent your house. So you're going to have a hundred grand in cash. Plus we're going to get the rent on the house, which at, you know, on the low end is five grand a month. And that money is going to just keep going into your, your, your cash account. This is a one year game plan. So it is time bound by the end of that year. You guys have to have figured out how you're going to make some money. Okay, we're not done with Lisa yet. There's more that's going on here. So stay tuned. If you have a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. It's Jill on Money. That's the name of the show. And that's the name of the website. And we will be right back.
401ks, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And, you know, we always point you to our website, to jillonmoney.com. And the reason is that is where all of our content lives. So if you're looking for a recent television appearance that I've done on CBS, on CBS Mornings or on CBS Evening News, you'll find it at jillonmoney.com. If you're looking for our podcasts, either the Jill on Money daily podcast or the Eye on Money podcast, which drops twice a week, that's on the website. I also write a blog and I keep that up to date. Mark makes it look a lot prettier than I ever would. That is there as well. We also have the uh, links to lots of different resources that you might find useful. So everything is at Jill on Money. That's why we tell you to go there. So check it out. Right now, we are getting back to Lisa from Austin, Texas. We're talking about her sabbatical, which kind of jealous that she's doing. You don't have to go back to making quarter million dollars a year because based on everything you've told me, we need for the two of you together to make about $130,000 a year. That's what we need. Maybe one hundred and fifty. If you could do that, you'll be able to make a transition the kids are going to be taken care of. They're in college already. One will actually be ready to graduate from college. And you'll start contributing to retirement accounts again. And I think you can do this. I really do. But you can't let one year turn into five years. You can't afford to do that. But, you know, because you have no mortgage, because you already have a couple million dollars saved, and because you're willing to go back, come back on the other side of this and work, I think you're in great shape. Mark, do you agree? Yeah, I'm just curious what the plan is when the sabbatical is over. So, so that's the nerve wracking part, right? What if um, no one will ever hire us again? What Not if, happening. What if we're unemployable. What, can I ask you a question? You don't have to tell me the exact nature of your business. Is your business at all involved sales? No. You don't have to sell anything? Like, what do you do? Well, give me a little bit of a background of what you kind of sort of do. The doctor's office. Oh, your doctor's? Yes. So you're in the generalized healthcare field. You know what you could do? Uh, a lot of doctors can do. They can go work at like weird telehealth places. They can go work at insurance companies. And let me just tell you something. You guys have skills. You're in healthcare. You could literally be like the assistants in someone else's office. You might even be able to go back to what you were doing and find that you can do it for someone else. You're like, you might say to yourself, hey, you know what? My friend is a vet and she did this. She owned her own business, similar, because you kill yourself and it's all based on you. And you know what she did as she got older? She's like, I don't want to have my own business anymore. She goes and works in a hospital, in a vet, a veterinary hospital, and she's an employee. And are you going to tell me that you can't get a job as an employee doing this? I bet you can. And so if the worst case scenario is that you're both kind of working part time, doing a little bit of what you were doing, but you didn't have the anxiety of running your own business, I think you can make it. Here's what I want to tell you. You're fine. You're going to be okay. The one big deal that I need you to worry about is to make sure you've got cash on hand to get through this six to 12 month sabbatical. I think that what you need to be very clear about is, do we hate what we do? Are we burnt out of this job? Or are we burned out of being small business owners? Because there is something very different about those two questions. I owned a small business. I hated it. Every day, I hated being a business owner. I should never have. I was like a, I was an accidental and then ultimately a reluctant business owner. I did not like worrying about employees. So I never will own a small business again, except for like what I do for myself. But I had to really come clean with myself about that. Then the next question is, do you like what you do actually? Would you like to do what you do for someone else? And when I asked myself that question, I was like, mm, I'm kind of overdoing like financial planning and investment management for, for individuals. It's exhausting. And I have a very thin skin. And I love giving financial advice like here on a podcast or on a radio show or going on TV, but having long-term relationships with people who are really freaked out about their money. You know, I didn't know if I wanted to do that anymore. So having the time to ask yourself those questions and to come to different conclusions is incredibly valuable. 
That's what I was going to say. Like, why, why all they figure out the answers to those questions since they're only going to net, you know, maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand from the sale? Do they have to sell this business? And that's what I was wondering. Like, if you really don't have to sell the business, maybe you just leave it be. Maybe it's just dormant. Oh, I never thought about that. I mean, maybe you, when you take the sabbatical, you realize, hey, this is something we want to keep doing. Maybe just not at the same level, and you come back and fire it back up. That's right. a great idea, Mark. I like that Let's idea. Put it on pause. Let all, let all the uh, people know. Yep. Put a we'll be back sign on the front door. Absolutely. And even be able to say, like, here are three people that we think are great for you to consider. Send the business elsewhere and say, you know, gone fishing. And if they're, if you come back to that, then fine. What about the idea of, you know, building a business, selling it, and then go ahead and building another one and selling it instead of just keeping, you know, working. You can do that. You can do that. It's just, you know, that like you, now that you know how to build a business, it would be, Mm -hmm. you'd have a lot of lessons learned. It may be that as you just start thinking about it, as you guys are just kind of chilling and having its game plan germinate right now, I might get rid of like the clients that bug me because maybe if you strip away some of those people, Maybe if you don't make two fifty a year and you made one ninety between the two of you, but you didn't have the nasty nasties, you might like it better. Right. All right. One more segment with Lisa, and then we'll wrap it up. It's Jill on Money, the program that tries to answer your financial questions. We will be right back. You're back. It's Jill on money. Let's get back to Lisa. It's a little scary though, because you don't want to like throw everything out, you know, sell not and, going to. and then, you know, let's say we do sell. And then what if, I mean, you know, this is what we know in our adult life. What if well, you'll get a job? Don't it. worry. This is the whole point. You got to go. You're going to have to take that step, girl. I am so sorry, but that is, that is the issue that I'm writing a whole book about it. I just sent in my manuscript, but I would tell you something that the deal is that when you are looking to reset something big in your life, there is risk. What you have done in your sort of being this very uber responsible couple is you have decreased the risk because you have a pile of money that allows you to take the risk. Okay. So, you know, if you, if you came on the air with us and you told me that Uh, you know, we have $50,000 in cash, we have a house with a mortgage, and we have a retirement account with 500 grand in it. I'd be like, you're smoking it, dude. You're not going, you can't do it. But you guys can do it. But it will be uncomfortable to you. But isn't it more uncomfortable to be at a place where you're just pulling your hair out? I feel like there's more for us somewhere. I just don't know what that is. And we're we're like in 10 years from now, that may be a little harder to transition. So Uh, I could, I could not agree more. Now mm-hmm. is the time to do it. I feel good about this plan. Yes. You stay in touch with us and I let will. us know how things go. Because I think that we're we're sunk in. We're ready for you to do it, okay? Yeah, I got the green now, line. Yeah. Yeah. Before you go, you're going to make sure you've got your health insurance that's a good in plan. You're going to have, you have life insurance, right? Yes. And you have your estate documents done? Just a will. Do me a favor, especially if you are going to travel, a will power of attorney and a health care proxy. If something happened to you, someone's got to be, you know, your your spouse or if something happened to you guys together that maybe your older son is able to execute your wishes, get those other documents done as well, okay? Okay, that's it. That's the program. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. Try to lift someone up today. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>